Chapter 4. Now we're cooking. Yes, yeah, the weekend at the country kitchen. Got a grill full of food with the southern fixings. Honky tonkin'. Ray Riddle. I was in eighth grade, and my friend Benji Burris and I were walking to school one day and saw Smo driving his car down the road. He was in this low rider with tinted windows, and he had this crazy bleach blonde hair. He was a total character. Benji said, yeah, that's my cousin, Schmo. Fast forward two years later at a party when I was in 10th grade. We met at a party, and from there, we started hanging out and hitting back rows together and just kicking it. I was a DJ, so we'd work on music when we hung out. I already had the whole setup in my bedroom. I had maybe 10 cool hip-hop records like Cypress Hill, Criss Cross, DJ Jazzy Jeff, and The Fresh Prince. Everything else was Mozart or some weird unknown country artist from the 60s, and I was looping those and then making drum beats with a 707. Smo showed up with Adam's drum machine, and he wanted my help. He had written some poetry by then, but he never really rapped on a record yet. He'd been listening to rap music for years and had the style of a rapper already, and he wanted to put his poetry to music. I figured out the drum machine, and we were in business. At first, we were digging our music, and our close friends were into it, but Smo hadn't found his tone yet. Back then, Haystack was a big influence in the style of music we were listening to. It was hood, dirty South rap we were doing, but West Coast influence. But this was way before country rap. So at the time, we were just imitating Haystack and Trick Daddy and Eminem. Just trying to make beats like that and follow in those footsteps. O-Rig is one of the best people I have had in my life, especially during those times. We were instant best friends, musical soulmates. It was like whatever one of us lacked, the other one made up for it. We made awesome music together. Crazy enough, his dad was also a career Navy guy, and we were both born in the same hospital in San Diego. I loved O-Rig's family, too. With O-Rig, it wasn't about partying. We were working. O-Rig probably kept me out of prison. I honestly believe I would have never discovered my talent without him. He was a positive influence on me in a time when I really needed somebody. Ray Riddle I knew at that time Smo was getting into a lot of trouble with the law. When he met me, his trouble started to kind of go away because he was focusing more on music. I was really focused on music at an earlier age, so I didn't get into the kind of run-ins with the law that Smo did because I was always in my room working on beats. Then when I met him, we started doing that together, and it became more important than anything else to both of us. We copied the dope game on cassettes and took it with us everywhere. It motivated us to work on more beats. The first people I gave my tape away to were some hippies on a camping trip at Fall Creek Falls. I played the tape and they didn't believe it was me. Enough people seemed to like our music and we found our rhythm. We decided it was time to get serious. By this time, I had moved where I actually live today. We had the studio set up in the house and it just got to be too much. Now where I live is my mom's family's farm, and on the side of the property is an old building. Back in the 1890s, up until the 1940s, the building was an operating store. At first, we just used the building as a smoke shack because it hadn't been cleaned out in years. It actually kind of smelt stale and like dead mice now that I think back on it. Well, we decided it would be the perfect spot to relocate the studio. I asked my dad for help because he was an electrician in the Navy and had a knack for carpentry. He did all the wiring and built out the control room and the vocal booth. We had so much fun building that studio together, it was like the old Pinewood Derby days. One day we were working on the vocal booth and he suddenly drew up like he was having a muscle spasm and rushed out of the room. He said, follow me, we're going to the hospital. He jumped in his El Camino and peeled out. I really didn't know what was going on, but I followed him. He got down the highway a bit, and I noticed he was slumped down in his seat. It scared me to death, so I pulled up beside him and yelled, What the hell's the matter with you? He said, Oh, I dropped my cigarettes. Once we got to the hospital, the apparent stroke was just a fat boy cramp. He helped from start to finish on that studio. After a few months, we were done. We decided the most appropriate way to celebrate the grand opening was to have a huge party in the field. The newly renovated building was the VIP room that people could pay to hang out in. 
I definitely remember Chris Yancey got naked that night, and I flipped a golf cart. That should tell you what kind of night it was. We named the studio The Country Kitchen. Now I had the plug on having a place to record music. I had been to another home studio in town a while back and knew there weren't many local spots to record. Orig and I had recently been to Missouri and had a horrible experience at a studio. Not to mention we lost a lot of money. We had a crew by this point that we were making music with and we needed money to fund our project, so we decided to establish Yayota Records. People came from all over and we were making a lot of bread doing studio sessions. In between sessions, we worked on our own projects. Orig went to school to become a producer and sound engineer during the day while I poured concrete. In the evening, we would grill out and work all night long. Orig would show me everything that he learned in class. We literally learned as we went. The studio had a couple of couches and we would write and make beats, jump in and record, and then straight to the next song. It was complicated, but we learned so much during that process. Ray Riddle We weren't really aiming for a sound on Country Kitchen. We were just making sounds and exploring the possibilities and our limits of what we could do. We were very creative, so that process just happened organically. That album was my first attempt at really mixing and mastering and actually making a CD. My dad was supportive through the whole thing. He seemed proud to see me follow the project through. I even dedicated the second track title, Killa, for him. The entire thing took about three years to create. Ray Riddle Smo's dad was one of the greatest people I've ever known. He definitely was supporting everything Smo was doing musically because it kept us out of trouble and gave us something to work towards. We had a marker board in the studio where we put our goals and would check them off. Killer was proud. We were doing live performances at the VFW while we were working on the album. Everything started to be a little too much to juggle, so I reached out to Chris for some help. He designed our artwork and helped with distribution. He was a huge help and always has been since. We needed an investor, so I used some connections from my dealings in the hustle to fund getting the album pressed. From there, Chris got us in the stores, and we were finally being heard. Ray Riddle His brother Chris was actually the executive producer of Country Kitchen because he helped us come up with the game plan of getting CDs made, and he said to us, why don't you guys put your money where your mouth is and take some of your best works and make an actual, tangible product? So that's where he pushed us to have direction. He came out with his camera and knew a little bit about Photoshop, and he helped us put together the album cover art. Chris Smith. I was the Photoshop guy, so I could do the artwork graphics, and we collaborated to build the album graphics the way it is on the CD. Once we had CDs, we had the product to push, and I was an excellent salesman. We sold them out of the trunk in Nashville and put them in consignment smoke shops around town. We had CDs at the local corner store and at my buddy Rodney Yo's barbershop. My stuff is still on sale there today. Thanks, Rodney. JJ. It's true. When the Country Kitchen album was out, we used to go down to the street corners in Nashville and sell them for a couple dollars if we could. After selling so many CDs, we started performing more. We would perform for anyone that would listen. One of our first shows was on Halloween night at the annual JC's Haunted House. We had smoke bombs, strobe lights, and a ton of people. It was also the first time my parents saw us perform. It was awesome. Andy Muehlhauser. After the haunted house opening, we threw a party at my house, and he put on a show in my backyard. We probably had 300 people there. He got all these other rap acts from Nashville, Columbia, and Franklin who came to my house to see the show. The Halloween performance had gone so well that we decided to pay the $50 entry fee to the Shelbyville Christmas Parade. My dad let us borrow a trailer and help us construct our float, which was really more like a moving stage. My mom made a Santa suit out of sweatpants, a hoodie, and some fur. We performed our first ever Christmas song. All I want for Christmas is my six gold teeth, a total of 46 times during the length of the parade. That song can be found on YouTube under Ghetto Christmas. Go look it up. I love that my family was a part of the whole thing. The next morning, we were on the cover of the paper. Ray Riddle Killer was very supportive in every aspect of Smo's music. 
He helped us build backdrops. And when we did that Christmas parade, I drew characters on wood, and he'd cut them out and secured them onto a trailer he let us borrow. He even let us borrow his truck to tow it on. He'd do anything for Smo. I had started to gain some recognition in the rap game, but that didn't slow the hustling. On top of that, my dad was diagnosed with lung cancer. I had a family and bills, so I worked any job that I could get my hands on. I started pouring concrete with a good friend of mine, Travis Edwards. He was also the lead singer of a heavy metal band called Ballistic Whiplash. He let us open up for him, and their fans were great. I learned a lot watching him perform, and we loved the exposure. While Ulrich was at SAE school in Nashville, we found out his instructor was the MC at Kung Fu Coffee on 4th Avenue in Nashville. We paid $40 for a 15-minute spot and to put my face on the flyer. At first, the crowd didn't know what to think of me, but we got a lot of compliments that night. We shared our CDs all over Nashville and even went to the hip-hop station in town for support, but they turned us away. We knew we needed to get on the radio, but we just didn't know how it was going to happen. At my house, we picked up a hip-hop R&B station in Athens, Alabama. We figured we would give it a shot, so we made a dope advertisement using our music to announce an event we had coming up. We purchased some airtime in a commercial slot, and they liked our style so much, they reached out to us. They had a DJ that needed some drops done, so we made some 60-second intros for his set. Shout out to DJ Lil D at 93.3 in Athens for all the love. Around that time, O'Rig and I met some dudes in Nashville and we started making music with them. Even though we lived in the country and they lived in the city, we had plenty in common. We laughed about writing gangster rap in a cornfield and kept experimenting with the beats and my tone. Together, we began to work on my first solo album, The True South. Pay attention when you listen to the album. We did all the voices and created the fake radio station sounds. O-Rig taught me so much as we tinkered with sounds and instruments. Ray Riddle In 2003, after Country Kitchen came out, we met some guys in Nashville and put together a group called the Bushes Boys, which consisted of Smo, 6'5", and Little Nitty and the Hitman. And then on the production side, 88 Keys, C-Note, and me. They were already making beats and doing battles in Nashville, and we all joined forces and became a killer trio. Smo had a more urban, hip-hop, battle type of delivery, and working with other rappers and producers, we were getting better. C-Note, 88 Keys, and I made a beat together that wound up being the beat for Country Living. That's the first hip-hop type of beat we ever did. They were actually making fun of the country because these guys were from Nashville, and they'd come all the way out to the middle of nowhere to make music. While O-Rig was at school, I worked on the album and recorded people to make some side money. We worked on the project when we could, and between pouring concrete and working on music, I was going nonstop. Ray Riddle Everything we were doing was completely independent and underground. We threw a release party and held a meet and greet at Hastings to sign our album. Smo was always a marketing genius. He was the one with the game plan. Once the album was done, we had to find a way to distribute our record. We didn't have luck at any of the bigger names, but luckily... Hastings and Murfreesboro and Tullahoma let us sell our music there. At several points throughout my career, Hastings was kind enough to sell my music and my mom's cookbooks. Sadly, it won't be around to sell this book. R.I.P. Hastings, thanks for all the support. Ray Riddle I paid a company to master the record and had already sent the mixes off to them when I found out Smo had already set a release date before we were going to have the masters back. We had to do the masters ourselves. It took us three days, and we literally did not sleep. We would master a song, burn it to a disc, listen to it on the truck speakers, take notes, and go back and fix whatever changes we thought. After those three days, we were so excited, but exhausted. Three months later, we got the masters back that we had professionally done, and ours sounded better. Looking back and comparing Country Kitchen to The True South, to me it was a huge step forward, and that album is definitely a milestone in both my and Smo's journey. When I look back on the country kitchen in the true South days, it's like being a freshman in high school. We were excited and eager, but still so young and inexperienced. Sometimes, though, I miss those days because we had so much freedom and creativity.